Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! It might be quite a lot of Corbyn today on the programme, so um, I should read this out from the beginning so that everybody feels properly represented. I see you are doing the marketing for the Tories and Israeli government today, James. Ken's gone. Why not talk about the murder of Palestinians, a UN discussion which is being blocked by the USA? Uh, I would. Um, I, I'm just not sure that I'd get an hour's worth of calls on that. But I'll, I'll certainly leave it on the to-do list. Uh, other areas where Jeremy Corbyn's influence may be felt include our first conversation, which will be about Ken Livingstone's rather sad decline um, into dangerous, dangerous positioning. Uh, yesterday, when I suggested to you that Theresa May had created a hostile environment for the homeless, as we were discussing some of the measures she introduced in 2014, about eight minutes after I said that on this radio programme, Jeremy Corbyn had tweeted from his official account that Theresa May had created a hostile environment for the homeless. Uh, so I'm going to suggest today that she's also created, it would appear, a hostile environment for um, people on benefits. There's a really, really interesting piece in today's Guardian, which, as you will know if you've listened to this programme for a while, I've, um, to my shame, actually, I don't know why I'm giggling, I've only really started reading it since the Windrush scandal broke because I couldn't believe that Amelia Gentleman had been doing that astonishing journalism for six months with so little notice being paid by the rest of the media. And it occurred to me that, that even... Someone who likes to think of himself as being the sort of polar opposite of, of, of tub-thumping Daily Mail-style journalism. I'd bought into the idea. Going back to the days where he used to have 108 pages of, of social services jobs. Do you remember? He used to have supplements. I read it as a student. I hardly read it since. And um, my embarrassment to be honest with you, is compounded every day. How many other people who use the word The Guardian or Guardian Easter as a pejorative have never actually opened it? I mean, people on the right must never, ever, ever look at it, but they're utterly convinced that it's... Anyway, I don't, it's enough free advertising for them. They report, and it's a brilliant report today by their social policy editor, Patrick Butler, looking at a study that comes close to proving so-called benefit sanctions, a key platform, of course, of Ian Duncan Smith's tenure at the DWP, um, don't actually have any impact at all on getting people back into work or, or, or reducing... Um, any of the problems they're supposed to reduce, all it does, this policy of sanctioning people on benefits, is allow the government to claim that they're clamping down on, on that sort of tabloid myth or that tabloid exaggeration of, um, you know, feckless work shy layabouts sponging all the time. So we'll definitely have a look at that later in the programme. Uh, I think it's very, very interesting. I'm drawn, actually, as well, to Ryanair, believe it or not, on the five million quid that they pick up in extras every year. But we have, uh, I suppose, room today for, for some of your suggestions as well, because I want to start off with Ken Livingston specifically, and if we do two political topics, the second will probably be um, inspired by an excellent piece in the Times today by one of the finest political journalists in the country, Rachel Sylvester, who talks about Jeremy Corbyn almost uniquely for a recent leader of the official opposition, essentially now holding the balance of power when it comes to stopping, should he be so minded, and I personally don't think he is, but should he be minded to stop Brexit, she argues very powerfully today that he probably could at least in some ways. Eight minutes after ten is the time. That's enough about what we're not talking about this hour. Let's kick in with what we are talking about this hour. Do you know, it just occurred to me then that the last time I read an excerpt from Mein Kampf to you, I didn't tell you that it was from Mein Kampf. I told you that it was from Amber Rudd's first major speech as Home Secretary when she laid out plans to make companies publish their lists of foreign workers. Um, it's amazing, isn't it, how the environment has changed since then? I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that it, a lot of people were, were, were chomping at the bit for that kind of policy. Yes, publish lists of foreign workers, but as I've pointed out to you in the last few weeks, since the, the, the sort of usual magnifiers and amplifiers have stopped blaming immigration for everything, um, so the public concern has waned as well. So I know sometimes you think I obsess about the opinion formers in this country, the newspaper owners and editors and columnists. And, of course, people that do this for a living as well, for good or for ill. But that, that, surely that proves that I'm, I'm right to be very, very, very concerned about the power they wield 
The notion of immigration being the only issue under discussion in the run-up to the referendum. And now, even Michael Gove tried to claim yesterday that this country offers the warmest of welcomes. It's a strange state of affairs, but one which I, I mentioned because the last time I read an excerpt of Mein Kampf to you, I was pretending that it was Amber Rudd's speech. And then we put the two excerpts side by side. I, I read you what Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf about foreign workers, and then I read you what Amber Rudd had said in her speech about foreign workers. And, well, let's just say that the similarities were pretty stark, and five million views later, the policy was quietly dropped by the current government and the ex-Home Secretary. So, um, I'm reading another excerpt from Mein Kampf today. I think it should come with a health warning. Warning. It's profoundly anti-Semitic, and it was written, of course, by Adolf Hitler before... This is the crucial point. Before he went mad, which is Ken Livingston's description of what happened later, before he went mad. Well, and this is, this is it right here, OK? While the Zionists try to make the rest of the world believe that the national consciousness of the Jew finds its satisfaction in the creation of a Palestinian state, the Jews again slyly dupe the dumb goyim. It doesn't even enter their heads to build up a Jewish state in Palestine for the purpose of living there. All they want is a central organisation for their international world swindler, endowed with its own sovereign rights and removed from the intervention of other states, a haven for convicted scoundrels and a university for b budding crooks. So, I really liked Ken Livingston. He, 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 he got under my wire. I, I generally try to avoid forming any warmth towards any politicians. It, it's not a very good tactic professionally. It's part of the reason why we have so few of them on this programme. Uh, James Cleverley's a great example. Just talking to Nick a moment ago. I did a TV show with him not long ago. I really liked him. I got on really well with him, which means if I ever had to interview him about, I don't know, Conservative MPs uh, making racist tweets or councillors being suspended for racist jokes, I'd, 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 I'd be compromised slightly by the fact that I just, on a human level, really liked him. He's got a fascinating story, military service, really impressive politician. Trying to avoid tribalism, um, <laughs> for me at least, involves avoiding politicians like the plague. So... I, 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 I failed with Ken because this was very much a London radio station during his tenure as mayor. And uh, if only I'd known at the time that I would not be allowed anywhere near Boris Johnson shortly after he got into City Hall. I, I came to really relish the access and uh, openness that Ken Livingstone always displayed. I liked him. I, I, I was aware of the kind of legacy of Red Ken and uh, what you could now probably describe very much of, as, as a Jeremy Corbyn flavoured attitude to politics, but he was a decent mayor. He was a good mayor, wasn't he? And, well, I think he was, anyway. And he won as an independent, which speaks of an almost unique status in modern British politics. The idea that you could win an office as, as mighty as the Mayor of London without a party machine behind you. The first time he ran, of course, he ran against the official Labour Party candidate. History often overlooks that fact. Frank Dobson was the official candidate. Ken Livingston was an independent. That speaks of an enormous personal popularity. But oddly, you know, without giving away any confidences, even then, many people in the Jewish community were concerned about Ken Livingston. I, I, I sort of whispers reached me in my early years here as a radio presenter that there were profound concerns, presumably about his public comments regarding Israel and the Palestinian people, as opposed to historical comments about Adolf Hitler. They came a little later. And it, it was an early indication of the problems that are currently besetting the Labour Party. Um, whether you think they're problems or not is moot, OK? Whatever you describe them as, smears perhaps, they are besetting the Labour Party. So focus on the verb, not the noun. Yesterday, former London Mayor Ken Livingstone announced he was resigning from the Labour Party. He'd been suspended since 2016 over allegations of anti-Semitism following comments he made about Hitler and Zionism. But he said he didn't accept he was in any way guilty of anti-Semitism, although he did say he was sorry his words had caused offence and upset. So will the episode come to define him? Here's a reminder of how he got here. You're the reason she's abolishing the GLC. As I was saying before I so rudely interrupted 14 years ago. The 30th Olympiad in 2012 are awarded to the city of London. The 
good party. What does it mean? What you? Are you looking down the wall, criminal? No, I'm doing a show with that joke. Ah, right. right. There will be, therefore, no apology or expression of regret to the Daily Mail group. Let's remember, when Hitler won his election in 1932, his policy then was that Jews should be moved to Israel. He was supporting um, Zionism, and his boy went mad. 13 minutes after 10. I'd love you to tell me from your own perspective how, how you think this happened how because uh, i have a slightly sad feeling that it's essentially the the stubbornness of a of a now quite old man and that's an appalling epitaph really for a politician how did you end up going from the astonishing leadership displayed in the aftermath of the july the 7th terror attacks the injection of almost undiluted joy into the national bloodstream that the Olympics bid, successful Olympics bid, delivered, both on Ken's watch, actually happened within 24 hours of each other. I don't know if you remember that. The um, celebrations regarding the Olympics bid were very, very, very quickly doused by the tragedy that, that befell London the following morning. And, and Livingston, I think, covered himself... In, with great credit over both of those stories, the, the truly the two extremes of the national pageant, the tragedy and the joy. So that man there, who I really liked and admired, today shuffles away from the Labour Party, still muttering under his breath, or rather live on LBC to Nick, about Hitler and Zionism. I, I don't know enough about this. It's, it's like a lot of people. I've arrived relatively new at this weird relationship I understand criticism of Israel. The, the, the quote from the Mein Kampf that I just read to you is, for me, it was brought to my attention by an article David Badil wrote last April. Um, and in his article, he, he makes clear the, uh, the problems that some people have in separating issues. And he actually writes quite brilliantly, and obviously he writes, as all Jews have to say now when talking about this subject, I do not support the appalling actions of the present Israeli government. It's the, it's the, here's what worries me. It's a deliberate refusal to separate the two. That's where the anti-Semitism comes in. It's also where that fellow whose tweet I read out at the top of the show doesn't realise that he's been anti-Semitic when he suggests that I'm somehow in hock to the Israeli government. That's, that's the anti-Semitism that a lot of Labour activists don't realise is anti-Semitism. When they suggest that somebody like me is being told what a, a approach to take on a story or what angle to take on a story by... Well, let's go back to Mein Kampf, shall we? By... Um, they're slyly duping the dumb Goyim. You see, that's what you are suggesting when you suggest that someone like me is doing the bidding of, whether you name them or not, whether you go as far as the Daily Telegraph and stick it on your front page with regard to George Soros, or whether you just sort of quietly think, yeah, well, he's being got at. That's anti-Semitic. It just is. I say what I like about Israel. I, 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 the, the abstention, the British government's abstention on that, call for an inquiry into the recent... Um, killings at the border is, is to me absolutely unbelievable and, and it should be bigger news but of course it's, it's not a topic for a phone-in show what is a topic for a phone-in show this is 0345 6060973 oh, is the number that you need am I sounding like an apologist for Ken Livingston this morning I really hope I'm not I'm trying to understand how a politician of principle and considerable metal has ended up in such, such a sorry state. And I'd love you to have a go, very simply, at explaining it. Maybe we need Jewish people to lead the line on this one. I don't know. But I'll, 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 take, I'll take whatever answer you've got. And it can be as nasty or as... Not forgiving, that's not the right word. Should we suggest charitable? So farewell then, Kenneth Livingstone. You were the mayor of London. You were the head of the GLC. You politically probably had more to do with the running of the country's capital city than anybody in living memory. Um, and your career ends in utter shame and disgrace. At least it does from where I'm sitting. You're more than welcome to argue. I would, however, prefer you to start by telling me why you think it went so wrong, how it went so wrong. And I, and I think, given that I don't have much myself apart from the entrenched stubbornness of, a, of, a, of an ageing man, uh, I don't have anything. See if you do. Rana's in Kenilworth. Rana, what do you think? Hello. Um, I 
I uh, think Ken Livingstone is a wonderfully socialist man who cares about the less wealthy. I don't think that he is a, uh, uh, an anti-Semitic in any way. I think he's just got perhaps slightly confused between the wonderful success that some uh, people who happen to be Jewish and who happen to be also capitalists uh, have had. And I think that he's just um, an ardent socialist who's kind of, you know, got maybe slightly lost. Uh, but I don't think he's in any way anti-Semitic. I think he's just got slightly confused in the capitalist so socialist. When his, let's remember, media. when Hitler won his election in 1932, his policy then was that Jews should be moved to Israel. He, he was... Um, let's get this absolutely right. Supporting Zionism. He then went mad and ended up killing six million Jews. So um, but that's after he wrote Mein Kampf, after he wrote the line about the Jews, again, slightly duping the dumb Goyim. That's Hitler that wrote that. Um, before he went mad, according to Ken Livingstone. What's that got to do with getting confused about wealthy Jewish entrepreneurs? Well, I don't, I don't think that... I think the, the fundamental question is whether... The fundamental question Ken for Livingston. now is the one I just asked you. So what, what, what has that got to do with being confused about wealthy Jewish entrepreneurs, suggesting that the Hitler who wrote Mein Kampf was not mad, but was a Zionist? I, I don't think anyone would ever say that Hitler was not uh, anything but anti-Semitic. And I don't think... No, one well, 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 no that, that's the whole point about this story, is that when Ken Livingston called him a Zionist, he was categorically stating that he wasn't anti-Semitic. He subsequently went mad, despite having written the, uh, the book during his period of sanity, presumably. Um, and that's when he became anti-Semitic. With the greatest of respect, if you, if you think that this debate is not about Ken Livingston's view that Hitler wasn't anti-Semitic when he was a Zionist, can you be an anti-Semitic Zionist, do you think, Rana? I think Zionism and anti-Semitism are slightly different. Well, they're profoundly different. Um, one is a hatred of Jews and one is a belief in the existence of the Israeli state. But can you be an anti-Semitic Zionist? Because that's what you're claiming Hitler kind I of was. No, I, no I, I wouldn't agree that right. you could, no. No, so Hitler's belief that getting rid of the Jews from Germany was... Um, a top priority, and therefore the inducements that were offered to some terrorised Jewish people to leave Germany, um, that is what Ken Livingston held up as evidence of Hitler being a Zionist. The idea that Hitler was a Zionist is, is as offensive as it is wrong, and that's why Ken Livingston has been accused of anti-Semitism. It has absolutely nothing to do with wealthy Jewish business people, in or indeed socialism. Hitler, in, in terms of Hitler uh, suggesting that a Jewish state should be set up, um, may well be interpreted as being a Zionist. It doesn't even enter their Hitler heads to build up... This is Hitler for okay. you, speaking, OK? But it I... doesn't even enter their heads to build up a Jewish state in Palestine for the purpose of living there. All they want is a central organisation for their international world swindler endowed with its sovereign rights and removed from the intervention of other states. A haven for convicted scoundrels and a university for budding crooks. And you just said, live on the radio, in front of over a million people, that, that you think that proves Hitler's a Zionist. I don't, I don't know that Hitler... You said it was an interpretation, Hitler, didn't you? Yes. I, I, think, I think Hitler, before he went mad, used... He, he wrote this book before he went mad. I don't think Hitler did go mad. I think Hitler was, was uh, to use an inappropriate and inadequate word, Hitler was clearly mad from pretty much the word go. I think Hitler was a very evil man, and I think the level of Hitler's madness changed, and the quality of his madness changed. But he was, without doubt, one of the most evil men in the world, and he would use whatever ploy... He could. So to suggest that he was a Zionist, which he began this call by saying was due to Ken Livingston's confusion about wealthy Jewish business people, I, I, I mean, you, we can go around in circles, and you're not really addressing any points that I've, I've put to you, but what you said at the outset, what, what you said at the start of this conversation was absurd. I think it's reasonable um, for Hitler to have appeared... Uh, as a Zionist artificially. All they want is a central uh, organisation for their international world swindler endowed with its own sovereign rights and removed from the intervention of other states. Mate, I, I don't know what you've been reading, but you clearly haven't read much Hitler. No, I try not to read too much Hitler. Well, then you probably should hold fire on having strong opinions about what he did and didn't stand for. I don't think that Ken Livingston... I need to ask you one slightly uncomfortable question now, because we're going around in circles. When you sort of picked up the phone 20 minutes ago and you thought, I'm going to ring in on this one and stick up for Ken Livingston, what exactly were you thinking? I think that Ken Livingstone has been uh, badly treated by everybody. I think he's a wonderful man. 
and I think that... So, so you just wanted to ring mean, up and, and sort of read out the, 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 the slogans in the I middle of to, greetings cards. You have no understanding or knowledge of the issue that has I led want, to his resignation. I, I, wa I wanted to support Ken Livingstone. That's fine. That's think, so, you know, I send think, him a Christmas card, but don't ring in to talk about the issue that he has resigned over and then display complete ignorance of what that issue is, Rana. I think that Ken Livingstone... Isn't. I think you've delighted us for long enough. Michelle's in Whetstone. Michelle, what would you like to say? Um, hi, good morning. Hello. Uh, sorry, can you, could you go to someone else's house? Um, sorry about that. Um, I'll tell you what, you, you, you sort yourself out and then we can talk, because I've got an awful lot of people listening to the programme and I think that was a little rude to them. Gary's in Newcastle. Gary, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, I, Gary. I think, I think that... Ken Livingston's resignation, and if you read the text of his resignation, I'm sure you did, you'll know that he said that he believes that the focus on his disciplinary action was... A yes, it's not a resignation on principle, is it? It's a resignation yes. on pragmatism. And I think that the point that needs to be understood here is that it robs the Labour Party and Labour Party members, such as myself, and also the Jewish community, of a conclusion to the disciplinary action and with the statement that would have come out from that which confirmed what Ken Livingston had done wrong and why he was bringing the party into disrepute and why what he said was so appalling. And I really think that I want to address, I was listening to one of the previous callers who tried to defend what Ken Livingston was saying. I think that the main point to make about what Livingston said about Hitler and Zionism is that his offence, the offence that was caused, is not about discussing uh, what he believes to be a historical fact. It's historical revisionism to suggest that Hitler was a Zionist because Hitler and the Nazis wanted to have a Jew-free Germany. Mm. And they wanted to do that progressively by any means possible. They progressed from expelling Jews um, to locking them up. And then, you know, we all know how the Holocaust happened. It was a gradual build-up to a genocide. To suggest that the German Zionist Federation shared the same motivations as the Nazis, or that the Nazis shared the same motivation as the German Zionist Federation when they tried to evacuate as many Jews as possible to the only place at the time that was accepting Jewish people in Palestine, uh, is deeply offensive. And to try to suggest that there was some sort of plot between Nazis and Zionists to colonize Palestine at the expense of Palestinians is absolutely horrendous. And that is what is most offensive. I, I, I'm going to run out of time. And, and you, your, your knowledge is impressive. I'm interested in your interpretation as well, Gary. How, how do you think someone like Ken Livingstone... Well, actually, no. How do you think Ken Livingstone ended up in such a deep hole on this? I think that conspiracy theories and particular strands of the left are very seductive and that Ken Livingstone has gone down this route not just suddenly over the past couple of years but progressively, you know, we have this about real anti-Semites don't just hate Jews in Israel, they hate all Jews. He gave, you know, defense of Nath Shah even after Nath Shah. Even after she did, she'd apologized for her comments and attributed some of her anti-Semitic... Uh, comments to genuine ignorance, um, which she then sought to address. But after she'd apologised for them, Ken Livingston carried on, carried on defending her. It's, I, I, I'm a little bit, Gary. Thank you. I'm just going to hit the news. That's the only reason I'm curtailing the call. I, I, I think for me, it's 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 a d degree of shame that's attached to having been commentating on Ken Livingston's mayoralty and following the Labour Party and leaning uh, in most election periods more slightly more towards them than anyone else. And I knew nothing about all this. Now, that's what I find so baffling, and that's perhaps selfishly what I'm trying to unpick today. Uh, how can someone like Rana, our first caller, ring in to somehow describe Ken Livingston as being confused about wealthy Jewish business people? That, that's pretty close to anti-Semitism, isn't it? You're having a conversation about Ken Livingston, you already start talking about wealthy business people? It's a little bit Rothschild-y? No? But then these people don't know that that's anti-Semitic. They honestly think that I get a cheque at the end of this programme from Benjamin Netanyahu or that I get a pat on the back from some mysterious puppet master. They honestly believe that. It's very, very odd. How did it happen? 10.35 is the time. One theory, of course, is that it was always there. It just bubbled to the surface latterly. I think we've got a caller who's going to make that point shortly. Um, I'm talking about Ken Livingston. I'm talking about his resignation, which even now doesn't really address the 
anti-Semitism problems that have beset Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party because his avowed reason for resigning is, is to stop being a distraction rather than to accept responsibility for his suggestion that Adolf Hitler supported Zionism. Um, how, how did this happen? And I, I, I will be a little impatient with you if you uh, insist that there's nothing anti-Semitic about suggesting Hitler supported Zionism and then refuse to acknowledge those words that I've dug out from Mein Kampf as probably the most reliable indicator we can get of Adolf Hitler's thoughts, given that that is his book of thoughts. You know? My struggle, I think it translates that, doesn't it? So that that is, I, I, you know, that's a precondition that you have to accept. Once you've accepted it, the number you need is 0345 6079 is the number you need. Uh, Michelle is in Weston. Michelle, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning. Hello, Michelle. Um, have you sorted uh, out your little problems at I the front I door? So That's quite all right. I, I just... um, um... I think if anyone's gone mad, it's probably Ken Livingstone. I think he's gone bon He's gone bonkers. Mm. Completely bonkers. Go on. I mean, I, mean, I think that's the only uh, um, explanation for this. I mean, that, that he, his main crime is that he has not um, applied historical context to the, to, to, to the facts. Yes. And that's the main problem. And, and without historical context, you can put two and two together and come up with five. Yes, but once someone's uh, pointed uh, out uh, to uh, you that two plus two is four, why do you think he kept insisting, no, 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 it's actually five? I go back to the fact he's bonkers, maybe. Well, you can't, I, I can't I, have I, that. I, this I, is a no, sophisticated okay, okay. radio programme. We quoted okay. Orwell and Chomsky yesterday. You can't just call someone bonkers. We've been reading out of Mein Kampf. We've gone to primary sources. <laughs> OK, OK. Uh, look, he, he, he has said it enough times, and he's, I mean, like with your first caller, he's obviously duped a lot of people because a lot of people believe him. And it doesn't seem to matter to the vast majority of, of, of la la Labour mem members. They genuinely don't care. Ken Livingstone is a Labour hero to them, and if he says it, it must be so. The facts themselves do not matter. It's as simple as that, and that's the only explanation that I can see. Well, you, you, haven't mentioned is you, haven't, you haven't mentioned Israel, and in a way I'm grateful to you for that, because your analysis, it, it would apply to anything where stubbornness in the face of contradictory evidence is, is clung to almost as an article of faith and, and that describes yes. Ken Livingstone and it arguably describes a number of, um, as you say, Labour Party members. Yes, I, 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 I think that's actually the case. The facts are totally irrelevant. If your hero, whether it be Corbyn, McDonnell or any of the raft of, 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 of people that are uh, uh, supporting Labour nowadays, uh, if they say it's so, it is so. And you do not contradict them, because if you do, you are wrong. Full stop. And, and you'll be drummed out of the, the party or you'll be drummed out of town. I, I, I never know. I, I don't know whether I'm asking you this, Michelle, but I will anyway, because you're here. How do you deal with stuff like this? I, I don't know if it's a bot account or a troll, or, 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 or but he, at least Hitler had his own thoughts, unlike you. You are just a radio owner's puppet. How, how seriously do you take... How, I'll, I'll ask you, because you sound um, lovely. How seriously okay. should I take? Should I respond to that? Do you, do you address these schools of thought? Because I've always worried that by giving attention to these kind of attitudes, you, you, you actually give them oxygen, but it doesn't seem, ignoring them doesn't seem to have worked. My, my opinion is that knowledge is power. You have, you've read, I don't really read all of Mein Kampf, but, you, but you've read some of Mein Kampf. I think I've you, read all of them. You, yeah. you have that knowledge, you have that understanding as, as an educated man. Oh, bless you. <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to the, these people, say that they're educated but they they, they they do not have the ability to analyze and to question and if and, and to and not, to retreat and, yes yes and to retreat yes. and say you were wrong which we all find yes. very that we all find very difficult yes. to do arguably politicians find it harder than anybody it's a strange one isn't it it really is and and it, yes. it, do, do you feel any sadness at ken livingston's decline well, he was, as you said, he was a, a, a good mayor at the time. He was an excellent mayor. But something has gone very wrong. Mm. And I, I mean, I don't know what, what obviously what it is, but the, the, the main problem is he has so much support. And I'll tell you what, I don't know quite whether or not 
we can do this as a topic, but I find it astonishing how many people... Because here's the thing, this is the funny... Um, this is the vice in which people like me are caught. I, I sit here and say, I have been a newspaper journalist, I've done a bit of telly and I've been a radio journalist for well over a decade, I've worked for a variety of bosses from a variety of backgrounds. The idea that there's some sort of Jewish lobby at the top of the pyramid in this country which is exerting undue influence on people lower down the pyramid is about as close to insane. Actually, we've got to stop with the, with the mental health vocabulary. I, I'm going to be a bit more careful about that, which is about as close to um, absurd as it's possible to imagine. And then, of course, what you would say, if you were one of them, you'd say, ah, but you would say that, wouldn't you? So I don't know how you break that circle, Michelle. Well, you see, as a Jew, I, I, I feel rather swindled myself because I never got the memo about being in control. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have my own personal media empire. I'm here. waiting for I, all my checks off George Soros, yeah, Michelle. They've obviously I, got I, lost in the same place as your memo. Yeah, I feel deeply cheated here. I, sh I should be living on, on, on a, in a huge ma mansion on Fifth Avenue. You and me both. You and me both. I, it's yeah, not I fair. I mean, George Soros, if you see him, can you tell him I'm not getting the money? It's not coming you're through. Right. It's you not... see him before me. Well, how do you say that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, have a lovely day. I'm sorry if I was a little curt over your front door problems, but um, a few things are more frustrating than going live to a call on a, on a full switchboard and the person on the other end is in the middle of doing something else. But now that I know it was your front door, you're completely forgiven, as I hope am I. Lee is in Edgeware. Lee, what do you reckon? Oh, hey, James. Hello, I just wanted to make the point that I think you and some of your callers, in good faith and innocently, are mischaracterising Ken as having been sort of historically a good guy yes. who's just suddenly taken this bizarre um, turn to the to wherever, to insanity. But it's not. It's um, He's historically clearly sort of come from this position from place conviction and belief. In, in 1982, Ken was the editor of a magazine called The Labour Herald. And in that... As this is the cartoon with the um, yeah. Star of David. Yeah, he published a cartoon of the Israeli Prime Minister at the time, dressed as a Nazi, given a Z Carl, with a Star of David replacing the swastika. And, and this is an Israeli Prime Minister whose parents were killed um, in the Holocaust. So my point is that every sort of twist and turn in Ken's career, whether it's that cartoon, whether it's calling a Jewish journalist a concentration camp guard, whether it's an attempt to equate um, Zionism with Nazism. Every time he's not only does he slander. Just mind your phone, Lee. I, I, it's just the I phone. Mind, that's all right. Keep it no. clear if you can. Um, so not only does he slander and incite, but he's, the comments are deliberately cal calibrated to be as spiteful as they can possibly be towards Jews by consciously taking like the worst crime enacted against them and using it to attack them. And he's done this consistently, not because he's bonkers. It comes from a place of belief. And his what is the belief? In, but in your own words, what are you accusing him of believing? I think that the, his confusion and hatred comes from a misplaced belief that in order to champion um, the Palestinians, you have to misrepresent Zionism and negate the concept of Jewish self-determination. And, and I don't so think he's done... I don't think he's ever negated look, the concept it, of Jewish self-determination. There's it, something subtler going on James, in what you're describing. James, this is, hear this out. I am. So when, when he tries to conflate Nazism with Zionism, Nazism, any civilised person on Earth would agree, is one of the most despicable ideas that have ever existed, that any civilised person will not only fight against, but they will be prepared to, like, physically and violently remove. And he's deliberately trying to conflate Zionism, Jewish idea of self-determination, with Nazism. But he's allowed, to, he's allowed to believe that some tactics undertaken by some Israeli governments over the last 50 years um, can be compared to some of the tactics undertaken by Hitler's government nearly 100 years ago. He's, he's perfectly entitled to that position. That doesn't make him anti-Semitic. You could... Shooting unarmed protesters, re regardless of where they come from or what they did, is, is, is you know, it's quite a fascistic tactic for a government to adopt. And when you're looking for the but apotheosis James, of fascistic James, tactics, you, you all reach for Nazis. We all do. James, you're conflicting um, localised, specific criticisms of... Um, particular Israeli policies. Well, so was his, Ken Livingston when he published that cartoon. His attack is a fundamental attempt, but he's taken the attempt to equate Zionism itself with Nazism. But you haven't provided any, you actually haven't provided any evidence of that. 
You, you've provided evidence of, of problematic behaviour, and, and for my money, suggesting that Hitler supported Zionism is is is, is disgusting, actually, uh, and very compelling evidence for an accusation of anti-Semitism. But I don't see this conflation of Nazism with Zionism anywhere. You've just articulated, has articulated the fact that you said Hitler support Zionism is an attempt to present to the world, misrepresent the idea that Nazism and Zionism were hand in hand. And yeah, like, OK. And well, I get that. I get that. I mean, he would say, wouldn't he, he would say that, that, that it depends how you define Zionism. And on this occasion, he was defining it as the exodus, um, pardon the pun, the exodus of, of Jewish people from Nazi Germany to... Palestine, uh, and and indeed that was encouraged by some Nazi economic policies because all your confiscated goods, you might get some of them back if you left the country and moved to Palestine. So if you take a very narrow definition of Zionism as the movement of European Jews to uh, a homeland in Palestine, then he, he would be able to at least intellectually defend his position. There's absolutely... But what he does there is he removes... There's no overlap of contact. There's no overlap of intent. And that's exactly right. It's the bluntness of the instrument, isn't it? It's the bluntness of it that's so dispiriting. But it, the, most, the most despicable thing about Ken's um, act is there's no indication of the absolute disparity of power between the Nazis and Jews living under Nazi Germany who were fighting to live. And so if there was any so-called collaboration, it's not people who've got a shared interest. But again, his, his call, again, I think I, I, you've made some brilliant points, but if, if I, and I've tried to understand this school of thought, the comparison wouldn't be between the two constituencies you've just described. The comparison would be between the Jews under the Nazis um, and, if you will, the, 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 the residents of Gaza under the Israeli government. That, those are the comparisons that people make. No, that's you making that comparison. That's not a comparison that um, Ken has made when he says Hitler was collaborating with the Nazis. You know, what, the, there was no um, sort of Israeli Palestinian conflict. Did, didn't say collaborate. Collab no, I know there wasn't. But he's comparing yeah. two periods of history, two different constituencies from two different periods of history, and and that is defensible at least. Uh, or, or, not that I'd want to defend it. It's ten forty-seven. You you often get taken by surprise by anniversaries. I find. Um, well, I don't know why I said you. I often get taken by surprise by anniversaries. Um, I can't believe it's been a year since uh, the Manchester Arena attack the Islamist terror attack on that Ariana Grande concert. A year. I mean, in many ways it feels as if it were last week, and in other ways it feels as if it were decades ago. I, I, anniversaries focus the mind, don't they? And there is uh, an awful lot of thought being focused in Manchester today as uh, probably my second favourite city in the country, or equal first, uh, unites to commemorate the victims of that attack in, in ways that, for reasons I still don't fully understand, managed to upset some so-called alt-right individuals. Uh, the idea that we, we shouldn't be uh, calm and compassionate, caring, loving, uh, focusing on what we have in common rather than what, what separates us. We should all be furiously attacking each other just like the terrorists do. I don't think I'll ever quite understand that mindset. And I tell you, if there's any city on the planet where it would never take hold, that city is Manchester. LBC's Rachel Venables is there all day, currently in St Anne's Square. Rachel, what's the latest? Well, James, I was walking through the city of Manchester uh, around an hour ago and I was looking at some of the trees of hope which have been planted to mark the commemoration. They, they dot from Victoria Station to St Anne's Square here and people have written some of the most incredible messages, some to personal friends and, and lost one, loved ones who they lost this time last year, others just more generally messages of support and love. And I was reading these messages and I was seeing the bees that have been spray painted on the walls and then this beautiful music started, started up and it was the choir of children voices and I think you can actually hear some of them still singing now it's the encore children's choir which were here in the centre of Manchester today as part of the commemoration efforts to mark 12 months since that tragedy hit the Ariana Grande concert on the 22nd of May 2017. We know that a bomb went off at 10.31 in the evening and that 22 people lost their lives. Well, one of the people who lost their lives was Olivia Campbell Hardy. She was from Bury, and this children's choir, which already existed before the attack, has renamed themselves. They've been getting support from Liv's Trust, which is something that was set up in their honour. And I've been speaking, actually, in her honour, and I've been speaking to a couple of the young children, the young voices uh, who've been taking part 
part in this choir today and about the commemorations, about the impact this has all had. Um, Sam, Joe and Archie are going to hear from them now, James. Um, guys, just tell me a little bit about today, about what it means for you guys, young people in Manchester, marking a year you know, since it's, the attack. It's a really, it's really special and it, like, it means a lot because to see like when we sing and we see p smiles on people's faces and like it makes us feel good that we're making these people happy. One of the things that I think was the most awful part of that attack last year was the fact that it was young people who were targeted. Did you guys know people who went to the concert? You obviously Ariana Grande, maybe you're fans of her, I don't know. Uh, what about that when it happened? I, I had one friend there. Um, I didn't know she was there until later on. But luckily, she, she managed to get away and was, was all good and OK, yeah. And, and Joe, you're, you're 12 years old, so what, 11 years old then. Did your parents talk to you about it? How did you feel when you knew that attack happened in your, in your home, home city? Um, yeah, my parents just came up to my room and told me and I just got really upset just thinking that someone would do that. So yeah, it just made me really upset. But today's like made it up to me, knowing that I can put a smile on people's faces. The, the music's beautiful. What do you think about all of the choices? I really love the music that we're doing, yeah. It's really jolly and it just puts a smile on people's faces. Yeah. And Archie, you go to Tottenham High School, which is the high school that Olivia went to. Talk to me about the effect that this, is, this has had on, on your school and some of your classmates. Well, our school's reacted uh, very good, uh, very well, and we've got a memorial stone with Olivia's name on it outside of the school. And when, when we see that today, and it makes us feel, oh, well, we've come together to do this and we've come together well and it's happened out good. And in the music room, uh, there's in some of the music rooms there's some displays about Olivia because she loved her music and I feel that that's quite nice to do that for the school. So to be able to celebrate these lives and to remember these people with music today that has been quite special for, for her and for the, the, you guys at the school as well. Yeah it's emotional here today but it's also exciting that we're all coming together to uh, commemorate the people who've lost their lives or family and friends of those people and yeah it, I, I feel proud of myself really yeah. Right. Well, Sam, Joe and Archie, thank you very, very much for speaking to me just now. Um, one of the songs which has really come to define the city, I think, is Don't Look Back in Anger, James. That was one of the songs that they were performing earlier. So I want to play a little bit of that as well, so you could probably have a listen at these children's voices here in the centre of Manchester today. Rachel Venables there, live from St Anne's Square in Manchester, where the first anniversary of that terror attack on the Manchester arena during the Ariana Grande concert will be unfolding all day, and whence Rachel will no doubt be um, talking to us uh, and to you right through proceedings. Uh, we've had a, an interesting but frustrating conversation about Ken Livingstone, and, and you know how this programme works. Some days I try to make sense of things that either don't make sense or uh, you don't like the answers you get that look like they do make sense. started off thinking Ken Livingstone is, is stubborn. It's just a sort of semantic point, actually. It's not that he said Hitler was a Zionist. I don't think I've said that this hour, but if I did, I misspoke. It's that Hitler supported Zionism, which is a subtle distinction, but I think probably an important one. Um, and the, the fact that Jeremy Corbyn has had him suspended, he's been suspended from the party for two years and nothing has happened. Nobody emerges from this with credit. Corbyn should have acted decisively and quickly, but didn't. Livingston, when he finally resigned, did so to avoid being a distraction. And I guess someone who has always rather liked Ken Livingston, I was trying to cobble together an analysis of the situation that, that could be at least described as charitable, and I failed. Um, it's only a minute or two left. Possibly we could have a, a reverse ferret of sorts. Marty is in Belfast. Marty, what would you like to say? I did, just before I uh, say what I came on to say, I have to uh, tell you that listening to that music for the kids... Yes. Uh, thing in there made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end and I just hope that everybody that was involved in Manchester gets through it today with as little uh, emotional stress as possible. Very nicely put, mate. 
Um, okay, so back to the, the topic. You mentioned something just before the last news break, um, and that's what prompted my call to say that when people um, air these views about, you know, anti-Semitic views, they have always been there, and it only seems to be coming more to the surface now. And mm. I get really, really, really annoyed with politicians of all parties um, who say something that shows they've got either sectarian views, bigoted views, anti-Semitic views. And then they can turn around and go, oh, I do apologise for that, and move on as if nothing had happened. I, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. He, has he said, I mean, is it is it specifically anti-Semitic to say that Hitler supported Zionism? No, it probably isn't. And I think I'm maybe on a, in, a, on a, in a wider view on the, 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 the political hmm. uh, people involved, because, you know, it's, whenever they say these things, that, to me, shows categorically what these people think. And if that's what they think, they have got no right to be involved in public life. They should be sacked. Uh, I, 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 I like you, mate, because I, I feel this a little bit as I get older. There, there doesn't seem to be... I mean, everyone gets a comeback. Even Neil Hamilton ended up in the Welsh Assembly as a member of UKIP. I mean, I'm, uh, what, what, what exactly do you have to do to, to, to have your political c c career ended? I don't know if you've been watching the brilliant Jeremy Thorpe drama on the telly but you, you, you know to end a political career in this country you pretty much have to hire a hitman to kill your gay lover anything short of that you get a second round that's kind of what you're saying isn't it but, but yeah pretty much pretty much you know and it's an old boys network old I, I don't know what it is I, 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 actually if you remind me we'll talk about that another day actually because I don't know what it is you know in any other line of work you could have a could you have a career-ending experience as a result of this kind of comment I